message is, I'll be your two. Tell your neighbor, I'll be your two. Okay, we might have heard it like, I'll be your plus one, right? If you're going somewhere and you need a day or you want to go without being by yourself, hey, will you go with me? Tonight, according to the word of God, we're calling it this, I'll be your two. Say it after me, I'll be your two. All right, Ephesians chapter 2, hopefully you're there. That's the only verse that I'm probably going to have you turn to tonight. The rest of them I just want you to write down. I'm going to be reading from the Message Bible quite a bit tonight. Now, in the pews behind you, there is an English Standard Version. I rarely use that translation, but it's an easy translation. It's a great translation. If you don't have a Bible, there's duct tape Bibles in that same translation for five in the bookstore. Otherwise, get with somebody that's older. If you're new in here, they can kind of help you navigate. I kind of use a bunch of different ones. But Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, these are our foundation verses. Because ultimately, in any relationship, in order for it to be successful, each person has to do their part. Turn to your neighbor and say, do your part. So God's part, write it in your notes, is always grace. God's part is grace, and grace is Jesus. Anytime you see the word grace, you want to see the word Jesus, okay? Grace is Jesus, and grace is God's part. But we have a part, and our part is faith, which means if we're going to experience Jesus, we're going to have to do our part, and our part is to walk by faith and not by sight or our senses. So grace is God's part. Faith is our part. Now, while you're writing that down, we're going to leave that on the screen. I want you to listen as I read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. These verses pretty much say what you're writing on the screen. For by grace you have been saved through faith, it's not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, which means God's gift to us in Jesus is not something that we earn or deserve. It's free. Say it's free. All we have to do is believe, according to Romans 10, 9 and 10. So God gave us Jesus Grace is Jesus. Jesus is grace. That's God's part of the deal. Our part of the deal is to walk by faith. If we're going to experience Jesus, it's going to take what? It's going to take faith. It's going to take faith. Hebrews eleven six. 6, write it down, says, Without faith, we cannot please God. It's going to take faith. Hebrews 11, verse 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But I want to give you another statement tonight that's going to help us in this message. Remember, say it after me. I'll be your two. Write this down. Faith is personal, but it isn't solo. Faith is personal, but it isn't solo. What does that mean? <clears throat> and as far as it pertains to that first statement, faith is personal, I want to encourage you to jump onto the Choose Life app or YouTube Watch Jumpstart from this past Sunday or listen to it. We talked a lot about faith being personal. But ultimately, it's between you and God. Just because your mom and your dad have a good relationship with God doesn't mean you're going to have a great relationship with God. Just because your youth pastors and Pastor Kathy and Pastor D and the leaders in this room have a good relationship with God doesn't mean you're going to have a good relationship with God. You're deciding that on your own, which means it's personal. However, it isn't solo. Everyone have that down? Faith is personal, but it isn't solo. Why isn't it solo? Say this after me. It's in the body. Colossians chapter 1, if you want to write it down, verse 18, says that Jesus is the head of the church. When you ask Jesus to come into your life, and that's Colossians 1, 18, Jesus is the head of the church. When you invite Jesus to come into your life, you don't just get saved and all of a sudden it's just you and him. See, a lot of believers think like that. Now, first and foremost, it's you and him, okay? But imagine in your life right now if you were just a head, right? Like, you need your body. You need everything else. You can't just be you and the head. You got to have all the other parts. 
right? Jesus is the head. But a lot of people get saved and they think, well, it's just me and him. No, it's not just you and him. Because immediately he set you in the body. Now we're going to put these verses up there from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is verses 12 and 13 in the Message Bible. Okay? Because faith is personal, but it's not solo. Where is it? It's in the body. It's in the body. Say it's in the body. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 says you can easily see enough how this kind of thing works by looking no further than your own body. Your body has many parts, limbs, organs, cells, but no matter how many parts you can name, you're still one body. It's exactly the same with Christ. By means of his one spirit, we all said goodbye to our partial and piecemeal lives. We used each used to live independently and call our own shots. It's a huge statement. You're no longer independent calling your own shots. But then we entered into a large and integrated life in which he has the final say in everything. In this generation, more than any other generation, self is exalted. In almost every advertisement campaign, do you, be you. We have selfie sticks. We have Instagrams where everyone can have this little piece of identity on the world wide web. But that's not how it is in the body of Christ. I want you to look at this chart. In our body, we have 11 major organ systems. 11 major body organ systems. Now, in each one of these systems, we're going to highlight number four, the cardiovascular system. There's all kinds of parts in just that one system. Let's switch over to this guy. And for those of you that really like anatomy, here you go. Here you go. All right, so in just this one system, look at how many different arteries and how many different veins there are. Guys, you by yourself, I mean, it's pretty much no more important than the anterior, anterior tibial vein. I never even knew what that was till right now. Okay, and I made a good grade in anatomy, honestly. I think I had 100 all year long. But here's the thing. You just throw that stuff in your short term, take the test, you're good, right? I mean, at the end of the day, unless you're going to be a paramedic or a doctor, no one cares. But anterior tibial vein. But without the body, without that system, without that head, it's useless. See, we have to challenge a culture that says you are self-sufficient. And you can make it on your own. First of all, you can't make it on your own. You can't make it without God, but then you can't make it without the body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18, which we're not reading that verse tonight, but you can just write it down. The Bible says he sets each and every one of us into a body. Do you know that it is God's plan that you be connected in a church family? That faith is personal. You got to go home and have a relationship with God on your own. But that's not where it ends. It's not a solo venture. I want you to write this down. It's called the law of entanglement. Now, this is an actual thing, the law of entanglement. And this is a thought from Dr. Caroline Leaf, who's a neuro, neuroscientist. And so she's really smart. Look at what this means. The law of entanglement says this. Our thoughts, our words, and our actions affect the people we know and love and everything around us. So, so everything that you do isn't just about you. It affects everybody that's connected to you. Some of you guys that are specifically in varsity, you know, you've had things transpire at school where maybe somebody took their life. And, and, and in their minds, they may have thought, this is just about me. But the reality is it left that entire school grieving. Not to mention those family and those immediate friends right? It's not just about you. Everything that you think, everything that you say, and everything that you do affects people around you. Science calls it the law of entanglement. The Bible calls it the body of Christ. Either way, it's the truth. And if you listen to Dr. Caroline Leaf, she has a podcast on YouTube. I encourage you, especially those of you that are older, listen to her stuff. She's stellar. She's an absolute genius. But, but here's the thing. Her take on science is science is, is just a way of proving what the Word of God already says is true. It's not the other way around for her. 
So I'm, I'm taking the scripture as true, and I'm using science to prove it. Same concept. The word of God calls it the body of Christ. Science calls it the law of entanglement. What's the bottom line? You can't do this by yourself. Tell your neighbor, you can't do this solo. You can't do it solo and be successful. Let's look at three skip scriptures in the word of God. Again, we're on the case for two right now. This is the case for two, proving that you cannot do it by yourself. Just write these, these references down. They'll be on the screen. One of them we already talked about tonight as we prayed for our president. Matthew chapter 18, 19 says, When two of you get together on anything on earth and make a prayer of it, my Father in heaven goes into action. And when two or three of you are together because of me, you can be sure that I'll be there. This is the case for two. Jesus said, this is Matthew 18, 19, his words. If any two of you agree as touching anything, it will be done by my Father in heaven. Again, this is the case for two. Faith is personal, but it's not solo. Turn to your neighbor again and say, you can't do this by yourself. I'll be your two. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 12, says, by yourself, you're unprotected. With a friend, you can face the worst. By yourself, you're unprotected. But with a friend, you can face the worst. Can you round up a third? Because a three-stranded rope isn't easily snapped. Now, I want to pause right here and I want to tell you, if you will understand and embrace this concept right now, whether you're a 6th grader or you're a 12th grader. Ecclesiastes 4.12. And recognize that faith is personal, but it's not solo. And there is somebody that God could join to my life that could be my two. He would make up my three. That's the best way to practice for marriage. And I don't mean with your two being a dating relationship. I mean, uh, uh, if you're a guy, a friend that's a guy. If you're a girl, a friend that's a girl. Because in that kind of covenant, like relationships, anything that's going to work right is going to have to be done by the blueprint of God's word. Relationships have to be done a certain way in order for them to work. If you will learn to cultivate this kind of perspective when it comes to your friendships, you'll step right into marriage and know how to do it. Some people are horrible at marriage because they were horrible at friendship. You can't be a good spouse if you don't know how to be a good friend. Okay, so again, by yourself, you're unprotected. With a friend, you can face the worst. Can you round up a third? A three-stranded rope isn't easily snapped. Last verse, Mark chapter 6, verse 7. Again, this is the case for two. When Jesus called together his 12, and he was teaching them how to do life and how to do ministry. Mark chapter 6, verse 7 is very insightful because it says he sent them out in pairs. He didn't send them out by themselves. Do you guys remember when Pastor Jeannie Mayo was here, for those of you that are in varsity and, and, and not new in, in here tonight, she, Jeannie didn't come by herself, right? She brought an assistant, okay? When Pastor Brandon came, did he come by himself? No. He brought somebody with him, okay? When, when Pastor John Jester came, he didn't come out. He brought a whole army of people. He brought his whole entire family, and then he brought assistants, a couple, right? He did not travel alone, right? That's a biblical thing. Now, many of you guys have heard me tell stories about an amazing youth evangelist when I was even younger than a teen teenager, but a teenager. And guess what? Back then he flew solo. And when he fell, he fell really hard and he fell forever and he'll never recover. He'll never recover. Now, does he have a new life? Did God forgive him? Yes. But can you restore Listen, if you fall from the top of Mount Everest, did you guys see that movie, Everest, those of you that are older? It's horrible. It's the worst movie ever, okay? We took the interns a couple years ago. We think it's going to be this inspiring movie, like we're going to change the world, whatever. We even take our picture in the movie theater in front of Everest. We get in there, we're all like, this is stupid. Everybody dies, and the people who don't die, all their fingers are like froze off. It's horrible. It's like the worst ever, right? But if you were to fall from Mount Everest and you survived. I don't even know if that's possible, okay? But I'm just saying, like, life's not going to be the same, okay? It's just not. You can fall so far that life is never the same, okay? They may be able to put a fake leg on you, but you don't have your real one, okay? They may be able to give you a new eye. Y'all, I remember in seventh grade, who's going into seventh grade? Please raise your hand. Can I tell you my most horrible story of seventh grade? Okay, here we go. So I'm in Houston. Who goes to Houston? There's lockers everywhere. It's two stories. It's a lot. 
My locker, seventh grade year, is way over here, second floor. All my classes are way over here, first floor, okay? I never went to my locker, y'all, really. I was, like, nervous. Like, I'm not going to make it in time. But so I would only go at the very beginning of the day and then at the end of the day. So one day, end of the day, I'm going to my locker. This girl next to me, she had a glass eye. Have any of you guys known anyone that had a glass eye? I'm not making fun of them, but I'm just saying when that comes out, that is, that is horrible. It's, a, it's like a horror movie that you're not even watching because you were just going to your locker. Like, I'm just getting my books in the end of the day, and you're like, <gasps> like, and, and so here's the thing. Here's the true story. Seventh grade horror, y'all. She had it in her hand. I'm serious. I'm so serious. And so I'm grateful for that technology, okay? I don't know what happened to her real eye. I never asked. And honestly, I, I think my stomach just turned just, just in telling the story. And it's been how many years? So it wasn't like my first reaction was to be like, what happened, number one? And number two, wh why is it right? What's going on? Why did it fall out? I'm just saying. And where's the nurse? Like, who puts that back in? Okay? And so I'm just saying... You don't fly solo. You don't fly solo as a, as a believer. And if you do, if you do, you're unprotected. And you cannot be successful. Now, I want you to look at two reasons why we don't pair up. Why do we hesitate to, to have this sort of relationship in our life? You can call it accountability. You can call it a faith buddy. You can call it a faith friend. You can call it a bestie. I don't really care what you call it, but there's biblical context that if you're going to be able to be a strong person of faith, you're going to need a two. You're not going to be able to do it by yourself. You have to get that wrap. You've got to wrap your head around that tonight, that faith is personal, but it is not a solo venture. Okay? It's not a solo venture. The reason why, just two reasons why we don't. Number one is we're foolish. What does it mean to be foolish? I made, a, I made note of a couple definitions. We're foolish, meaning we're reckless, we're thoughtless, or it could all be summed up in this phrase, we're casual with life. That's why many people don't double up. They don't take this seriously. And it's not that they're not sincere. I mean, I really believe that for the most part, the majority of you in here tonight sincerely love God. You want to serve him. You want to please him with your life. But I don't think for a second that there's not maybe a couple of you, maybe more, that are foolish. That you're just too casual. You don't take your relationship seriously. You don't take your schedule seriously. You don't take your time seriously. Foolish means you're just casual. It could also mean selfish. Fools are selfish. They're only thinking about themselves. Self is number one. Proverbs 18.1 has a lot to say about this. It says, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire and rages against all wise judgment. Basically, when you isolate yourself, it makes you a fool. Raging against wise judgment basically sets you up as a fool. So that's many reasons why we don't double up. We're just too casual. We don't take it seriously. Proverbs 18, 21, a man who isolates himself rages against all wisdom or sound doctrine, which means it's foolish. Number two, the second reason why, last reason we'll look at tonight, why people don't double up, why they don't take this principle seriously, is they're prideful. That's a simple one. Prideful, arrogant, another definition, sees others' views as unworthy. Like, I don't need them. Like, I got this. I got this on my own. Guys, that same leader, that leading youth evangelist, my early or late elementary years and into junior high, and even beyond, I mean, that was his attitude. Looking back after the fall, and again, you know, forgiveness is never the issue. Do you guys know that? Because of Jesus, forgiveness is never the issue. But but that doesn't eliminate all the catastrophe. Again, that girl, I even remember her name. Once she got her eye back in, right, all things being equal, that thing worked. Okay, but, but here's the thing. You have a glass eye, and it fell out today at school. 
which means maybe it could fall again tomorrow. That's not the same as having these two eyes that we have, okay? So even though restoration and a a new life is possible, the old one died, okay? So we can't keep going through life. I know young people that I've shepherded, that I've led over the years, um, so started being a youth pastor in 2009, Okay, so literally with this school year, we're, we're, we're a decade into this, guys. And so, so knowing that there are young people probably, you know, all over the United States that are sure of this one thing, God loves me no matter what. And even though I'm not serving him with my whole heart, I know that he loves me because they were taught that and they were taught that here. And that's great. That's great. But just because you know your ABCs doesn't mean you can put a sentence together. Just because he loves you doesn't mean or guarantee success in your life. Because the Bible says that in Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life, which means grace is eternal life. And how do you access grace? By faith. How do you do faith? By yourself? No. You can't do it alone. You can't do it solo. Pride sees others' views as unworthy Proverbs 28, 13 says, he who covers his sins will not prosper. I want you to see that word sin simultaneously as a word that we use false. Okay? He who covers his faults. False, as we find it in scripture, and in many cases the same word that we see sin, is like the San Andreas fault, like these, these cracks in the earth's surface. Okay, so I don't want you to see this as actual, you, you sinned and then you lied about it, but you have some fault lines, some weaknesses, so to speak. If you cover those up, and that tends to be our first response. Girls, if we have something on our face, and guys, you don't have the advantage of some of the solutions that we have, or you shouldn't, although there are some. Um, and, and so rewind, who cares about what I just said? Bottom line is, our first response is to cover it up, to conceal it, right? And the older you get, the more, the more significant a good concealer will be in your life. I got to be honest with you, I keep mine with me at all times, okay? It's in my purse right now, and it's an awesome one. If you need a good one or would like to know more about it, I will share it with you. That doesn't work as it pertains to faith. We can't cover it up. We can't cover up, man, I've got this issue, so I'm just, me and you, God, we'll figure it out. I've got this addiction, I've got this issue behind closed doors, but me and God are going to take care of it. It's not how it works. That's not how it works. That was the attitude of this youth evangelist that I just told you about, and you fall so hard, you can't recover. Okay, when they fell off Everest, and if y'all haven't seen the movie and your parents authorized, well, I'm just telling you they did not recover. Okay, it didn't go well. Okay, they have no fingers, they have no legs. Some of them are still up there, frozen on the side of the mountain, okay? It's not funny, but it's serious. This is life or death here, okay? You can fall so hard That you cannot recover, you actually die and have to be resurrected. Totally different life. It's not pretty. Okay? But that was his idea. I've got this problem, but I'll work it out, me and God. He flew solo, literally. Everything he did, he did by himself. And so what happened? It's so much easier. How many of you guys have ever played laser tag? Raise your hand. I'm horrible at laser tag. I think I'm doing so good, and I find a place to be all by myself. I always do this. I don't know why. Like, why don't I just stay with the group, right? And I tend to be, like, by myself, and I think I'm, like, sneaking down, and nobody sees me, and they're shooting me in the back like crazy. Like, I have the worst score of anybody, and I'm shooting constantly, and I think I'm doing so good, and the reality is, like, they're, li- I'm dead. In real life, I'm dead. Like, I'm dead right, right when they, they start one minute in, I'm gone, right? Because I'm by myself, Right? And I don't tend, I, I don't do that on purpose. I've just, I've only played laser tag probably like maybe 10 times in my whole life, which isn't a lot of times given how old I am, right? You would think the next time I play, I'm going to be better. I'm not going to do this because this is horrible strategy. But right, sometimes when we have an issue, we tend to just shy away from everybody else. Why? Because that issue is so magnified in our life. We don't want other people to see it. But yet an, an isolated soldier is easier to pick off. 
so much easier if you would stick with the group, right? So, so this is why he who covers up his sins or these things in his life that trip him up, he will not prosper. But when we confess those things and forsake them, so this can't just be when Pastor Dean was growing up, he grew up Baptist, but he had a lot of friends that were Catholic. And so every Saturday night before they would go out and do all that they did, which was horrible, we don't even want to talk about it, right? This was in his first life. They would stop by the Catholic church and the guy would go in and he would confess to the priest or the pope or whatever. And my dad thought it was so funny. Like he made such a mockery of it. Like it's so funny that you went and did that. And so now you're good. So this isn't just about confessing. This is forsaking it, walking away from it in order to have mercy. Okay. So hopefully at this point you realize even as stubborn and prideful as sometimes we tend to be, okay, I need a two. I need a two, and I'm going to get a two. What do you look for in a two? Okay? And I just want to encourage you really fast, guys, that in my life, I've had several different twos in different seasons. Okay? In one season of my life, seventh grade and eighth grade, I had a couple girls, and back and forth, they would be my twos until one of them lost her virginity. Eighth grade was my first experience with that. And so at that point, it's like, okay, rewind. We're kind of going in a different direction here. Um, So she wasn't my two anymore, but this other one was still my two. But then that only lasts, she moved away. So then I had another person through high school. This is not about finding that best friend that's going to be your best friend forever and ever and ever. Some people experience that, and that is so great, and it's totally possible. But, But I'm talking about in every season of your life understanding the value of having a two. Now, you guys remember Gospel Bill. You know how he works. Gospel Bill is always right, and he always wins because he loves God, and he honors the word, okay? And he teaches us how to live in such a significant way. So we're going to watch this clip really fast. We're going old school, and we all respect it and love it because it's going to help us realize what to look for in our two. I now present you the one and only. Say, Elmer. I got this problem. See, my mama, if she don't get $500, they're going to throw her out of her house because she's behind on her mortgage. And Elmer, I can't let that happen. But I found this scripture over in Matthew chapter 18, verse 19. It says, if any two folks will agree on anything on the earth, that the Lord in heaven will do it for them. And Elmer, I need somebody to agree with me. Will you agree with me that I'll get the money? Yep. You will? Yep. Will you pray right now? Yep. Great. Well, let's pray. You ready? Father, in Jesus' name, me and Elmer come before you today, and we thank you for this scripture, and we agree together right now for $500 coming my way. Lord, we thank you for speaking to people's hearts and getting that money to us in time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Elmer, do you agree with me? Yep. Then you believe I'm going to get the money, right? Well, I doubt it. What? Oh, McDamus, $500 is a lot of money. But I thought you said you agreed with me. Well, sure I did, but Mc, $500 is just too much money. Hey, I gotta find somebody else to agree with me. <laughs> hey, Nicodemus. Hey, Gospel Bill. Gospel Bill, come back here. You're just the person I've been looking for. Yeah, what do you need? Well, I just wanted you to know I found that scripture. Well, that's good. Did you pray with it? No. Well, why not? I couldn't. Nicodemus, you can pray with the scripture. You can do that. Nope, not this one. It takes two. Oh, you must be talking about Matthew 18, 19. That if any two of you on earth shall agree as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them by my Father which is in heaven. That's the one. Would you agree with me? Well, sure. I'd be glad to. All right. Well, let's pray right now. I pray you agree. All right. Now, Father God, I just thank you according to Matthew 18 and 19 that I receive $500. We agree in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for speaking to the hearts of men and $500 coming my way and we praise you for it. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name, I say amen. Amen. Thank you, Gospel Bill. Congratulations, Nicodemus. Glory to God. Hot dog. Mama, don't have to lose the farm. Okay, so you see the difference. 
Okay, Elmer Barnes is like going through the motions, people pleasing, like sure, I agree with you, but no, not really, I don't really, I'm not really into that, I don't think so, right? Where gospel was sincere. Write down these five things, okay? Because your two can't just be anybody. It can't just be somebody that you really, really like. It can't just be somebody that you have a lot of fun with. Number one, they have to be trustworthy, okay? Faith is personal, but it's not solo. There's a two for you. And I want you to understand the value of that tonight. And I want you to go into a new school year with a two. I don't want you to go by yourself. Because believers that go to school by themselves literally fall. So what does it mean to be trustworthy? Nosy people. Guys, have y'all ever been writing a text message next to somebody and they're totally watching you write it? And like, what do you do? Because honestly, like, sometimes what I want to do is just like slap them. Like, are you serious? And then another idea I have is to start talking about them on the text to whoever I'm sending it to them. To whoever, you know, because they're standing there creeping. Okay? Nosy people, people who creep, people who eavesdrop, people who gossip. No go. You're not trustworthy. And in here tonight, if this has been you, you need to not only repent for that, but you probably need to apologize for being that way. Just always want to know the dip. I want to know what's going on. Just aware of other people's conversations. Y'all, I'll tell you the truth. That creeps me out. Because I'm not like that, and so I don't expect people to be like that. So I'll be over here talking to my friend, and they're like, shh, so-and-so over there. And I'm like, are you for real? Like, they're over there, and they're listening to me. They're reading my lips. Are you for real? And this person's like, I'm like, well, where, where are we safe? Where do we go? That's none of their business. I'm not talking to them. Right? Your two has to be trustworthy. Do you guys get it? We're not going to go any further. Number two. Your two has to be strong, okay? If they're not strong where you're weak, then how can they help you? You never ask somebody for help with math that's got a worse grade than you do, okay? So you never tell your friend who's struggling to not listen to the same secular secular music that you're struggling not to listen to, hey, man, let's do this together. You're both going to (laughs) fall. That's going to last 24 hours, maybe. If they aren't strong where you are weak, how can they help you now? See, this is where that prideful stuff comes in because you reach out to somebody who's strong in that area, but when they start saying, hey, what's going on? You get flare up, you make excuses, you get all butt hurt. No, I'm done. See you later. Hey, you just asked me to be your two. I'm out. You're solo again. Because accountability and being a faith buddy is not a license to put up with other people's disobedience. It's just not. You tell them, listen, I love you, and I'm here for you when you want this, but you're not going to throw attitude my direction. You know why? Because I already got attitude. Okay, my dog wants to play ball all the time. My teachers are yelling at me. I got homework to do. I got dishes to clean. Last thing I need is attitude for my faith buddy. You just got dropped. You're not my buddy anymore. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Strong. If they're not strong where you are weak, how can they help you? So they need to be strong. Number three, this is a good one. They need to be likable. If you don't know how to be likable, or if you don't know if you are likable, just look straight ahead, look at the screen, no one has to point at you, and you don't have to receive a big halo on the top of your head. Likable is none of these things. Some people are so selfish, emotional, unreliable, and dramatic that they aren't enjoyable to be around. Something's always going on. They're always mad. They're always dramatic. They're always loud. Do you know that there's a time to be loud and there's a time to shut up? Do you know that there's a time for you to tell your story and then there's another time for you to shut up and care about somebody else's story? Okay, you have to be likable. Okay, this is what it takes to be likable. Selfless, not always emotional. Reliable, steady, not dramatic. Not all about you. You walk in the room and if everybody doesn't stop and stand up like when a bride enters, you're butt hurt. Okay, if everybody doesn't stop and listen to your story when three people are already telling a story, but you come in loud and abrasive. Do you know what it means to be abrasive? Just too loud. Too loud, right? Your two needs to be likable. And guys, listen, if you look at these things and you're like, I'm not like that. Listen, none of us are perfect, but we're never going to grow unless we acknowledge it and forsake it. You might need to apologize and say, honestly, I've been, I've been a high maintenance person to be around. I mean, I know up until tonight, we haven't been like 
you haven't been my two and I haven't been your two, but just in general, I haven't been likable. Number four, consistent. They should have a good track record. They should have a good track record. That's what it means to be consistent. Now, if you're in sixth grade and you've gone to different elementary schools and now you're all going to be dumped into only three middle schools, it might take a couple of weeks for you to establish new Christian circles because your schools have changed to, to, to hear God's voice for your two. But for the rest of you guys, by the end of tonight, I want the prayers already circulating for your two. The only people that are off the hook tonight to walk out of here and not have a clear direction about their two is a sixth grader because they're going to a new school and they don't even know what friends from church may be going to their school just yet. Number five, what am I looking for? Same sex, but they don't have to be the same age. They can be older, but let me qualify this. Not so old that you can be a different person around them because you aren't around them much. Okay? So they need to be the same sex. They don't have to be the same age. They don't have to be in your exact same grade. But they probably should be in your same school. Okay? So they don't have to be a sixth grader, but they, could be a, they need to be a seventh or an eighth grade. Do you understand what I'm saying? Let me give you an illustration. So when I graduated from high school, I was 18 years old, and I start traveling with John George almost immediately, and I'd already met him, but I'm like, every single day, y'all, I'm just like seeing Greg. And I can't even say that without smiling right now. Okay. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm totally crushing on this guy. This is not okay. This is not what I do. I'm strong. I do not crush. I do not date. I, d I am very independent. Like as a woman, like I have plans, I have places to go, things to accomplish. Guys are just going to get in my way, especially guys that dress like that, get in my way. Greg was so free in his fashion. And um, he was kind of like, y'all, it was just the 2000s. We dressed different back then. Oh, honestly, my own clothes. I'm like, what were you thinking? Like, you looked foul. Your hair was foul. You are foul. You're a foul person. Anyway, we'll probably look back on this very night and say the same thing. I honestly, like the Holy Spirit knows because he knows my thoughts. As Nicodemus was wearing his red bandana, I couldn't help but think about the one that was on my own neck. <laughs> and just smiled to think that me and Nicodemus... We both have a red bandana around our neck. There, you can't take, you can't, it is what it is, right? And so I'm, I'm just like, we're on our first trip, y'all. And so we're in Minnesota, Mall of America, that town. Okay, we're in a hotel. And so I had a faith buddy. that it, She was older than me. She was already married. She had kids. So this is an example. She was older than me. She already had kids. So I call on the phone. And I'm like, listen, here's the deal. Like, I've got to tell you because I'm not going to do this by myself. I don't know all these girls yet that are on my team, and honestly, they all like him too. So I can't be telling them my business because then it's going to get like, eh, and I'm going to win. Like, I'm going to win. I'm just telling you right now. And not because I'm a fighter, but because I'm better. I <laughs> just am. And so this is a 17-year-old, guys. This is seven. So if you're 17, you're just as stupid as I was in, in that moment, right? And so I'm like, I got to tell you, I got somebody to know. Like, please pray. Like, this is the deal. Like, I'm like so annoyingly. I'm, anno I'm on my own nerves at how I'm crushing about this guy, you know, like all summer long until Bible school starts and I meet a girl that's in that season with me. You know why? Because that lady lives here in Hobbs and I'm thousands of miles away in Tulsa. How is she going to hold me accountable, right? She can pray, but my new girl, she sees me every single day. And the reality is she called it way before I even told her. You know they're good, right? When, and so do you understand? So, so sometimes it might be like that where, where you still got to get it out. You still can't protect things that don't need to be protected. Sin doesn't need to be protected. Guys, anything that's in the dark, you need to know it's got to get in the light if it's going to be holy and sanctified because there is no darkness in God. So it's like, well, me and this dude, we're just trying to figure it out, and you're keeping it to yourself. I already know. It's dark. God's not in that because you're in it by yourself, and it's in the dark. And you're creeping, and it's just the two of you. No, forget it. I ain't got time for that. That's not biblical, okay? So, so they can be older, but let me have you write this statement down. If you guys will jump down to this statement, I just want to give you some practical stuff. Leaders walk in front of you. Your two walks beside you. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with having a leader that knows kind of what's going on. But the reality is your leaders walk in front of you. Your two needs to be somebody that goes to school with you. 
Okay, you let me in and say, hey, Pastor Charity, I want you to hold me accountable. Well, like, I see you at church. I see you every once in a while when we hang out. Somebody that sees you every single day, all day long, needs to be your two. I can't be your two. Now, I can be your two for a season, you understand, and I can always be your leader. One of these pastors, one of these other leaders in this room, they can always be your leader, right? But they can't be your two. So, so here's the thing. How do you, somebody asks you to be their two. Basically, they don't want to do their life of faith by themselves. Three things. You got to be aware. You got to be available. And you have to pray. Can we put all three of those up at once or not? If not, we can just go back. Oh, perfect. So we have to be aware. Guys, sometimes when you just put your eyes on people, you just know. So you have to be willing to do that. You're all in a room and you're hanging out and you're like, where's so-and-so? Hmm, there's so-and-so. So-and-so, why are you over there talking to so-and-so? Right? You have to be aware. You have to know where your two is. Okay? You have to be available. Okay, you can't be selfish. When they call you and say, hey, can we talk and hang out? And you're like, I don't want to talk and hang out. Like, I want to sleep right now, or I want to watch this movie that I'm watching, or I want to watch this, play this racing video game because I don't play violent video games anymore. Okay, in Jesus' name, because President Donald Trump said no, right? You have to be available. Okay, sometimes this isn't fun. Let me just tell you this. You may be somebody's two, but they may not be your two. And guys, that's honestly how it is, because if my two... Okay, if I go to this person and say, I need you to be my two because I'm spending way too much money. So I'm giving you my debit card. I'm giving you my credit card. This has literally happened. PK has been, Pastor Kathy has been twos for a bunch of people. Like open her office drawer. She's steady be having people's credit cards. I'm like, what? <laughs> right? She's there too. Right? Here's the thing. If that's my issue, I couldn't be somebody else's two that was struggling with shopping. Because we're struggling with the same thing. You understand? So your two is going to be different than the person's two that you are. Does that make sense? Like who you ask to be your two is probably strong in an area you're weak in. And you're going to be somebody's two because you're strong in an area that they're weak in. But bottom line, how do you be a two? You be aware, you be available, and you pray. If you would pray every single day for that person, I'm telling you that is one of the best things that you can do. Because even if you are aware and you're available, you're still not going to be with them 24-7. Now, having a two, this is so important. Because, guys, I've been twos for people for a long time. Number one, they were not honest. You know what I hate? Oh, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it worse than smells, which I really cannot stand when things smell weird. Like, like number two, like bad breath, like smells. I have issues with smells, right? But even more than that, I hate when people lie. And not only do I hate when people lie, I hate when they tell you half-truths. It's still a lie. When they only tell you, like, part of it, do you know what I'm saying? Do you guys know that, like, have you guys ever seen that, like, an iceberg? Like, you only see a little bit of it on the surface, but it's, like, massive underground. I've sat down with people in accountability before, and this is, like, I just have this little thing, and I'm just Oh, okay, I understand. Like, we've all been there. We've all struggled. And it's a lie. Like, they don't have this little thing. Give this monumental thing. Like, you got arrested last night. This is not a little thing, right? You gave it up last night. This is not a crush. You just lost it all to that guy. And you just told me that you're just kind of struggling, that you almost went too far. No, you didn't almost go too far. You took all your clothes off. You have to be honest if you're going to have a two. So many people deceive themselves into thinking, well, I have this person, but I've only told them what I want them to know. You have to be completely honest. Number two, you have to take initiative, which means it's not their job to be blowing up your phone. Where are you at? Why aren't you at church? Uh, three weeks in a row. Where are you at? You need to take initiative. You're not going to be there or whatever the situation is. You let them know. You're the first responder. You're not, this is not a babysitting service. Okay, having a faith buddy is not having a spiritual babysitter. Okay, it's having somebody that you trust, that you're vulnerable with, that you're making yourself accountable to. Number three, and I already kind of said it, do what you know to do. 
This isn't a baby, babysitting service or a Pope relationship. I've had people, I've been there twos before. Y'all, I'm steady BB in people's twos, okay? Even as a leader, they're like, I don't have anybody. I just don't have anybody. And it turns out, okay, here's why you don't have anybody. Because you've already killed 35 twos, literally, relationally. You've killed them all because you've lied to them. And they don't even want to see your face. And so as a last resort, you know Pastor Charity will never leave you or forsake you. So she'll be your two. And so what you do is every single week you do the same thing you know you shouldn't do. But yet you take solace and just come in and tell me, Pastor Charity, I messed up again. And so what? God is faithful. He's just, baby, you can do it. I love you. I believe in you, right? But here's the thing. You're not doing what you know to do. So at some point, the ax strikes, and it takes a lot. I'm just being super real. Like, I really don't let go, okay? Like, I would be, I never saw Titanic, but at the end, like, doesn't he die right there and she doesn't let him go? You know, like, let him go. Like, let him fall to the bottom. Like, just go on, girl. Like, you're going to have to meet somebody else. I would be Rose. Just like, you know? But you can't do that. You got to do what you know to do, okay? Okay, let me tell you this. Last statement. You can't receive strength until you first acknowledge that you are weak. And I think that, that again, that hurts our pride. Some of you are like, you're so foolish, you don't even care if you're weak. <laughs> you're like, I don't care, it's all going to work out. No, it's not. That's foolish. <laughs> it's not all going to work out. Don't be prideful and think you're so strong that, you know, nothing's ever going to happen to you. Just learn from Iron Man, okay? I know, it's sad, but look, look, it's real. Like, as real, as real fake as that is, that whole comedy, or co- what's it called? Um, what's it called? Comic. I kept wanting to say comet. That's in the sky. Can you, I'll just write down Joel, Joel 310. I'm trying to get a drink of water right now because I don't want to cough. Joel. Joel 310, let the weak say, I am strong. Tonight... I want you to first acknowledge some areas in your life, no more than three. There's several options to choose from. You may have to fill in one that's not there. And again, this is for your purposes, okay? As pastors and leaders, all that we can do is present the truth to you. Whether you choose to respond and to be a doer, that's completely and totally up to you. We want you to choose to, but that's up to you. So you acknowledge tonight there's some opportunities at the top, some areas where you could potentially be weak. No more than three. You want to diagnose those, meaning circle, the three that apply to you. And then you want to write down some details about it. For example, if it's natural disciplines like I never do my homework, I'm just too lazy. I never clean my room. My mom's always casing on me. A natural discipline, I never do my chores. That's what, that's what that is, okay? Spiritual disciplines, quiet time, coming to church, home relationships. I'm always having an attitude with my mom. I'm always yelling at my brother, okay? Attitudes, obviously, that could be in general with teachers, with other people. You're not over things in your past. Addictions, relationships, I'm always getting into trouble as it pertains to dating relationships or those kinds of things. Wrong thoughts. So depending on what three you circle, then you just want to make a couple of notes at the bottom. And then we're just going to, um, I think if we, if we have the opportunity, we can sing um, What a Beautiful Name. Because I want you guys to worship just for a few moments and pray in the Holy Spirit. And let the Holy Spirit maybe talk to you about who should be your two. And you've got now until the first day of school to sit down with them and talk to them about it. Okay? And, and, and basically kind of go over your paper and say, hey, listen, this is me. And if you're embarrassed about that, guys, that's religion. That's religion. I had friends that were too embarrassed to tell me, even though I knew. Like, you and you, y'all never come and hang out. Like, we all know what you're doing. Okay, you're not together at home reading your Bible. I know what you're doing, right? Some people, they're, they're not going to, doesn't matter how good of a two you are, they're not good at having one right? But you can't be embarrassed and act like there's not weaknesses in your life or you'll never be able to access strength. And he is your strength, but he uses people to help you and to hold you accountable. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes.